This is episode 81 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host, and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world. If I were to create the perfect duo in magic, they might just be Joe Given and Carol Massey. They've created a team where each of them is equal. A true illusion team. If you read between the lines in this interview, you'll find out exactly why they've been so successful. Now on with the show. Fun fact number 787. When John was a kid, his nickname was Wild Man, and he wore a black cape with the word Wild Man sewn onto the back. Welcome to the Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. My guests today own and operate Theater of Dreams. They feature famous magicians, psychic entertainers, mentalists, hypnotists, and variety artists from around the world. They've won three world championships in magic, had their own show at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, and have starred on television worldwide. Variety artists, I give you Joe Given and Carol Massey, the Dream Masters Theatrical Illusion Team. All right. Hi, everybody. Howdy, people. <laughs> Now we're gonna we're gonna talk about your career and your theater and all of that. But first, before we get into all that, how did you two meet? Oh my gosh, should I take that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were both performing separately, and somehow at Magic Island in Houston, one summer we were booked the same week, where I was doing the Illusion Box Act and he was doing stand up in the same show. Mm -hmm. And we were good friends that year, and kind of went our separate ways following some summer somehow got booked on the same week at the same time on mm -hmm. the same bill. So two years in a row. Yeah. Two years in a row. So the second summer, um, when he walked in, I went, Oh no, there's Joe Kiffin. What, what am I going to say? <laughs> Cause I knew I liked him, but I didn't say anything the year before. So, mm -hmm. uh, so sparks kind of flew that summer and we stayed in touch long distance for quite a while, but eventually I moved out here. Colorado. Oh. Conceiving of a, a really unusual concept for an illusion show. Carol liked kind of the direction I was going, and that's eventually what turned into the Dream Masters, mm. which is a, an illusion show that kind of has a very basic storyline about a guy trying to create the perfect woman in his dreams. So Carol never spoke during the years we were doing casino showrooms and performing art centers. She was a dream woman. Mm. I'm trying to create this woman in my dreams. So you're seeing dreams and nightmares unfolding live on stage in front of you. And she would always kind of seduce me and then turn the tables on me. So I ended up being the guy cut it into pieces and, and getting mutilated and so forth in these dream sequences. Yeah. And of course you're talking about on stage, not in real life, right? Oh, both. No, I'm just kidding. I'm still in one piece, though. Yeah, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting about that is that now, Joe, I watched an old video. It was an old English TV show that you did. Mm -hmm. You were doing a close-up routine, and you were talking about dreams in it. And I thought that was really interesting that you've carried that throughout your career. Well, what's been, to me, in my head, magic needs to be justified somehow instead of just being presented as a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And so I always kind of viewed things as story oriented somewhat, not heavy on story, but just a framework. So there's a reason for these things to happen. And we found that when we did the illusion show, uh, because we're presenting things as dreams and nightmares, uh, it gave the audience a hook to latch on to beyond just seeing tricks and trying to figure them out. Yeah. And so with that theatrical framework, you know, we found lots and lots of people commenting during those years about what they really liked about the show is that it had a story and the fact that everybody dreams and magic is a great tool to create surreal imagery. It was a perfect fit. And in fact, back then in uh, so many years ago, most magic shows that you saw, it was the guy kind of being the hero and put a girl in the box, make the girl appear or stab her or cut her in half or whatever. But you guys changed the whole game, right? Right. <clears throat> and it was fun because 
for me, of course, being the female, it was fun for me because like, for example, our cube zag, Joe goes inside the cube zag, which makes yeah. it impossible because it's so small. Same thing with our twister, Joe's inside the twister. And that also gives me chance to show kind of what I've been doing my whole career, yeah. get to be the person outside the box instead of get in and j just be silent. So I, uh, I got a lot of, of uh, enjoyment out of that, kind of seeing the tables turn. And the, the women in the audience would always comment to me, this is a great change. They appreciated that it wasn't old fashioned. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, one of the things that, you know, is, something that we use to describe Carol a lot of times because people are so used to that sexist approach where the mm -hmm. magician is the guy and you know we refer to the assistant as the bimbo with the saw whoever brings the props on and off stage so we call Carol in that show you know the power character because she's really the one responsible for the magic that's happening I'm the one that's the victim here mm. plays great and I had to figure out how to speak without words and so a lot of facial expressions and body movements and things had to be taken on my shoulders to try to get that across without using words. It's a good Can, challenge. <laughs> if you ever see Carol perform, you know, I'm going to make her oh. turn red, even though you can't <laughs> see the color of her face on, oh my gosh. on audio. She's extraordinary. The way she has eye contact with the audience and conveys, uh, I wouldn't say anything mean because in these dream sequences she's just uh, mischievous she's Intense. not yeah she's not <laughs> wicked and evil she's just toying with me the whole time and people love that playfulness but it's edgy we do things that are edgy it's pg-13 it's not uh circusy <laughs> so when did you guys know since joe was doing it separately and carol you were doing it separately how, how did you guys know that the two of you were going to be successful together we would stay up all night for one and we would sit by the pool soaking our feet in the pool after the shows literally all night till the sun came up oh. we just kind of had this feeling like i think we've got something here even though again went our separate ways because i had some contracts to fulfill as did he eventually it came down to okay somebody's got to move let's discuss this seriously I think Carol was looking to do a different style of magic Oh yeah, because she'd been doing the same style for so many years. I've always tried to do things that were done in a different format and in a different kind of vision. And so we both just really enjoyed comparing our imaginations and they always seem to match perfectly. Um, one of the greatest things about our relationship is that we both are huge music fans mm. and we're both musicians we hear music the same way, which is just crazy. And so when we're choreographing pieces to music and stuff, it, it's almost effortless because yeah. we just hear the moments in the music that can highlight the beats of the magic. And uh, we see eye to eye on that almost every single time. That I think helped us have confidence in doing these routines, you know, on a professional level. Yeah, in fact, I was talking to Paul Romani, who you know, yeah. Paul, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he was saying if he ever has a, a convention, he's going to get all the musicians that happen to be magicians together and do a jam session. We've awesome. talked about doing a show with exactly that exactly idea to that make idea. it a professional troupe. Oh, we were going to call it the Musicians. Oh, there you go. I'm all over that. That's fun. <laughs> That's a great idea. Is this news to you, Carol? No, no. I just love, I love. Re being reminded of it. It hasn't come to be yet, but we'll wait. <laughs> we actually had about six different magi uh, musicians that are, you know, they have real good chops in their musical abilities. And we thought, wouldn't this be cool? And we can mix magic and music together and each musician could take a turn doing magic while the rest of the band enhances it with their talent. Boy, and what a crazy brainstorming session that would be with you guys and Paul. And uh, I think Hal Myers plays a great banjo. You know Hal Myers? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, very well. Yeah. Yeah. He plays a great banjo and there, there's a lot of people. Steve Axtell, who's the puppet guy, he plays a mean keyboard. Ah. Um, Maybe got, we should have a convention here. <laughs> that's right. We got Mark Strivings, who has relocated to Denver a number of years ago, and he's a jazz saxophonist, plays oh with a lot of ensembles around town. I think we, we just created another show here. We Let's did. do it. Okay, John, we're doing this. All of you that were mentioned. <laughs> Come hang out in Colorado for a few months and we'll develop this thing. Contact us. We'll put a date out there. We have a venue. <laughs> we got the venue. Yep. 
<laughs> oh, you do, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> In fact, let's talk about your theater as long as long as we're talking about it. How did you guys get the idea? Gee, I'm gonna we're we're touring. We're becoming we're we're successful illusionists. Let's build a theater. Yep. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's an interesting story, but. It was, uh, in a sense, a tragic story. Um, we were doing casino showrooms and stuff. We had a manager that was taking us all over the country. And we got a call from a producer to do a minimum six-month show in Branson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. We were the headliners, co-headlining with Chinese acrobats. Okay. And without going into all the horror part of it, it turned out that the produce producer was crooked. We ended up realizing that this wasn't going to actually be a show that was ever meant to actually be successful for various reasons. We ended up having to, you know, cancel all our gigs for six months and take that contract. We ended up having to sue the producer for $80,000 and he oh was bankrupt an hour before court. So he wouldn't have to pay anything on the contract. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we didn't have any work for six months. And then during that dead time, uh, our manager passed away from a sudden heart attack. Mm. So our direction was just thrown off the train tracks. And as a result, we thought, you know, let's I, regroup. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if we could open our own place and bring in magicians from everywhere else and see if we can make a go out of that. And that way we can huh. stay in our own bed and we don't have to be gypsies. Yeah. So that's how it started. Yeah, one of the things that a lot of the people that I talk to on this podcast talk about the touring thing. You know, it, it's great at first, and then after a while, you want to sleep in your own bed. Yep. And be part yeah. of a community and have like somewhat normal life. You know, that's kind of attractive after you've been a gypsy for a while. Did you build the theater from scratch, or how did that come about? Actually, it was a uh, storefront kind of a startup church. It just made sense because, you know, they had – a sanctuary which became a showroom they had a little hallway with the men's and ladies separate bathrooms and so it was pretty much set up like a theater would be the office which believe it or not had a baptismal tub in it <laughs> okay that is now our sound room our sound and lighting tech booth and just interesting how it all just kind of fell into place we huh. spent three years looking for a commercial property that we could buy and we looked in denver during that time because our number one requirement from the beginning was that we needed to own the space. We didn't want to lease because it's such a risky proposition that we thought at the very least it can be an investment and we can either be landlords or sell the place and hopefully make some kind of money uh, in the resale of it. Just couldn't find things in Denver too expensive or zoning wasn't going to work or parking was an issue. And so we're in a community, at the time we opened this, I think Castle Rock was around maybe 15 to 20,000 people, and now it's almost 70. So nothing was available for sale in the commercial realm here except the one place that eventually showed up. We thought, well, let's, uh, let's see if we can make, make a go of this place, and it happened to work out. Yeah, it's funny, in the Branson fiasco, when we came back, to Colorado with no work. Um, I got my real estate license just for fun because I thought, oh. why not? Through that, we ended up finding this property, which was the church that we converted to a theater. We expected it to be like a five-year plan at the most. Yeah, we, we thought, thought if we could pull yes. it off for five years, that'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. And here we are almost 17 years later. So what's the most challenging part of owning the theater? Marketing. <laughs> yeah. Yep, isn't it with everything? <laughs> everything, butts and seats. Yeah, marketing and, and you know, we don't we don't really have any money to spend specifically on marketing. It's word of mouth, quality of shows. That's been it from the beginning. Um we never had any investors, so Joe and I are the owners, we're we're the maintenance people, we're the janitors, you name it, we do it all. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have really yeah. outside help. Every now and then, you know, we'll hire somebody to run license sound because if our shows on stage we might need a little help. But other than that, it's uh two people. <laughs> oh, so do you get any help with like TripAdvisor or any of those places? We try to go that route. I've made the mistake because I usually MC the shows and I still need to get more savvy about reminding people that social media is something that would help us. And so 
like us on Facebook, post something on TripAdvisor, all that stuff. I, I always space it out when we're on stage. It's getting better. But it's getting better. <laughs> it takes some time. Carol is the marketing department, so she's been really good about doing stuff on Facebook and so forth. But the biggest thing for us is word of mouth. Yeah, it is. We have some people that come to virtually every single show, and they have for years, because we don't just fill up every weekend with magic shows. We only do one or two a month. For the public. Due to the fact that, they have to be world class or we're not going to do a show. It has yeah. to be something that everybody walks out of there going, Oh my gosh, that was the most amazing experience ever. And mm -hmm. uh, then they tell people about it and then they keep coming back. And the balance is filled with private parties where Joe and I do the entertainment or we teach lessons. We also have a wizard camp. We rarely rent the venue out just as a venue without a show, but all those things manage to cover the mortgage. How do you go about getting your acts? Well, well friends. <laughs> we used to start, when we first started out, we were pulling teeth, calling, you know, professionals from around the country that were close friends and saying, please, please come out for a weekend in Colorado. You can't make a lot of money because we only seat 72 people. Mm. But, you know, we'll treat you like gold. You, you know, you can enjoy Colorado, be on to the shows and make it a mini vacation. It is beautiful. Holy moly. For a long time, that was a little difficult. We tried to generate as many shows as we could out of local talent, but there wasn't enough that had the caliber of our, you know, vision, the standard of what we wanted to reach uh, sure. to fill up a lot of the calendar. And now we don't solicit anybody. We haven't for years. Uh, the word has gotten out in the industry. Uh, and so people are calling us all the time saying, when can we work your place? When can we work your place? And some of them are super famous people. Yeah. John Carney calls and said, can I come back? We're like, duh, of course. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Can I? <laughs> How dumb are we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's going, come on, you know, when can we do it again? Those kinds of people. So it's, it's a thrill because it's a nice situation to be in. <laughs> apparently people love the showroom and they love, uh, our audiences are stellar. Talk right. about great reactions. It's mm -hmm. just, they're, they're awesome. Yeah, I read your list of performers, and it is a who's who of magic there. What a nice thing you guys are doing for the community, too. Oh, well, nice. that's kind of how we look at it. It's more of a labor of love. It's not about making money, and it never has been for me. I care so much about the art form. I love exposing awesome people and this great art form to people in a live setting because people don't get to see this stuff very often. And Certainly not Usually, live. <laughs> they don't get to see this caliber no matter what, unless they go to Vegas or New York or something. Yeah, it's interesting that you say art because I'll tell you a quick story. Years ago when I first started doing this, I sent my videotape at the time to a place called the Segerstrom Center. And if you're not familiar with that, in Southern California, they book a ton of shows and you have to be an artistic show. Mm. And what they consider art is dance, music, singing, etc. cetera. Right. So the letter that I got back they, they said, well, we watched the first five minutes of your tape, and because you're a magician, we don't consider you an artist. Oh. That hurts. And I think, Joe, you may have some things to say about that. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> art is meant to generate a reaction in people, whether it's fine art or music or writing or whatever. Unfortunately, over the decades, I think magic has uh, – Develop that reputation of not being an art form because there are so many people that are doing the same thing all the time. And the public perception is that everybody is doing the same tricks and the same style, and it doesn't uh, inspire any kind of reaction. Right. And that's part of the reason I've always done my magic kind of framed with stories or whatever. It's more of a, a thing that appeals to the imagination instead of just trying to figure out how to do the trick. You know, luckily, we've got things like Fool Us now, where people are being exposed to a lot of different styles and right. creativity. And I think people are starting to appreciate that, yeah, magic is an art, because you can use it to generate emotional response more than just a laugh. You know, Copperfield, I think, was one of the first people to really stick the artistic side of stuff in the public eye with his vignettes and things like that, where he's generating emotion, getting people to care about more than how the trick works. Right. Him and Doug Henning. Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, magic can produce so many different experiences and types of emotions from, you know, bizarre magic creating fear and, and danger to, you know, outright crazy comedy. 
it's a rich place to explore. And that's what's neat about seeing a lot of the performers that we bring in. I love exposing people. We just had David Parr in this last weekend. And we had a number of comments from people saying that is the most amazing show they've ever seen here. Hmm. Uh, not amazing, but the best yeah, the show. Best. Now, I'm not, I'm not familiar with him. What does he do? The show is called Cabinet of Curiosities. Okay. From the moment he arrives on stage, you just feel like you're in good hands. He has a couple of places in the show that he does give the audience a choice of where they're going. He get, they get to choose an object out of the cabinet, and then he does his presentation with that object. So it's pretty cool that they are in control. And, and Friday and Saturday nights were slightly different shows. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, so it's a very interactive idea, but each piece he does has got such a great framework to it because he has scripted things so well. I mean, you're watching real theater. It's not just somebody up there talking through the trick again. It's, you yeah. know, he has emotional hooks in every one of them. As a result, the audience walks out going, wow, what an experience. Yeah. Not just, well, that was fun. Yeah. Those were good tricks. No, that's a great idea. That's yeah. a great idea. Really? I know people listening to this are going to take that idea. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to something called a uh, fact or something John just made up. Sound like fun, you guys? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm uh, curious where this is going to go. <laughs> Is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a headline, and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And okay. if it is true, tell me the story behind it. Okay. Sound good? Yay. Okay. <laughs> okay, first headline. Here we go. Joe and Carol experienced snakes in a hotel. True. <laughs> what happened? Oh boy, you want to well, take it? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, our opening piece when we were doing the Dream Masters uh, storyline show was the opening moment of the show. I would step to the footlights, take off my jacket, and pull out a ten-foot albino python. Yellow. Okay. And we eventually, through that routine, turned it into Carol, which she looked like a snake woman, like her whole body was tattooed to match the snake. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing the Magic Castle and we were driving back through Vegas and stayed in one of the hotels in downtown Vegas. I can't remember which one it was now. It was so hot outside that we needed to make sure we didn't just leave the snake in her terrarium in the car. So we had to get the snake into the hotel and we couldn't carry her through in this giant terrarium because that wouldn't have been acceptable. <laughs> yeah. So we put her in a, you know, plastic shopping bag with handles on it smuggled her in and so we have to walk past the front desk and through the casino in order to access the elevators and we get on the elevator and i'm holding the snake kind of under my arms against my chest in this bag and this japanese guy that you could tell didn't speak any english he didn't know how to communicate but he steps on and he kind of nods to us and he stands off to our right we go up a couple floors the doors open and a security guard steps in. And mm -hmm. we were about to die. And it's like, oh God, I don't <laughs> want this snake to move. <laughs> yeah. And so the security guard is standing in the middle of the three of us or the four of us <laughs> facing the doors. We're behind him. And so is the Japanese guy. We called our snake Spot. <laughs> okay. That was her name. Spot starts crawling up my chest out of the bag. Oh no. And she's coming out like a foot. Going up, my, my head. <laughs> going up my shoulders, slithering out. And I didn't want to make any noise with this plastic bag and shove her back in and get the attention of the security guard. And we look over and this Japanese guy is looking at us and he doesn't look Japanese anymore. His oh. eyes are huge <laughs> and round. And he's looking at us like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> And we're looking at him, and then he looks at the security guard like, I hope he doesn't see you. And we're looking at him like, don't say anything. <laughs> and we both had this, you know, understanding mentally from different international languages. <laughs> and we go up about six more floors, and the doors open up, and the security guard steps out and just immediately turns and walks away. Never looked at us Never or anything else. Never turned around. 
and the doors <laughs> closed and all three of us looked at each other and just had this immediate sigh of relief like, <laughs> like oh woo! god thank god i don't know what he thought but he probably had a good story to go back to japan and say yeah these <laughs> oh, americans i'm sure <laughs> oh one time uh, i do magic with live animals also, I do magic with a dove, of course, like a lot of magicians, but, uh -huh. but also a chinchilla, you know, oh, tarantula, wow. all these different animals. So well, kind of similar story. One of the cages that I bring the chinchilla in, I snuck him into the hotel room. I go downstairs to have lunch or dinner with a friend and I come back and the chinchilla has gone He's oh. out of the cage somewhere. And I know he's in the hotel room somewhere. But I don't know where he is because there, you know, there's the bed and the the nightstand and the, yeah. you know, all these different things that he can hide behind. Suddenly I see his little, little face peek out behind the bed. I'm like, oh, I gotta <laughs> catch this thing. So for about the next 10 minutes, I ran around the hotel room trying to catch the chinchilla. And sure enough, I did. Uh, ends up there's a, there's a hole in the cage where he escaped. So he was running. I don't know how long he was running around my <laughs> hotel room for. <laughs> Good thing crazy. housekeeping didn't come in. We had a similar experience you just reminded me of. We used to travel in a hearse, a 1968 Cadillac hearse, mm -hmm. because it was a huge car. It was bigger than any van, you know, and it was low to the ground and it opened on three sides. So it was easy to load and unload. And so we had her in a in a, the terrarium and uh, we're driving. Wait, so you have a giant snake in a terrarium in a hearse. Yeah. yeah. We were quite the sight, I'll tell you. Pretty picture. <laughs> and so we're driving, we're driving, I don't remember where, it is, some casino somewhere. I think it was. And we go out like to it. unload some stuff and she's not in the terrarium. And we're like, uh -oh. oh God, where is she? What happened? And it turns out we had to lift up part of the carpeting and stuff like that. She had slithered under the floor of the hearse and was kind of snugged up over over the uh, muffler of the car. I guess she wanted the heat or something. Oh, no. But at least she wasn't gone, you know? But that was a panic moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had another uh, snake experience that was great. When we did that gig in Branson that we mentioned, opening night was a press night. And so they invited all the press people in and a bunch of VIPs. And I stepped right up to the front of the stage, in the middle of the stage. I pulled the snake out. And there's a lady sitting in the front row, and obviously she was terrified of snakes. She literally backed over her chair onto the guy behind her in the second row, and without even looking, she backed over him and ran sideways down the aisle and out of the theater. Oh that was our opening moment of the show. Ta-da! Yeah, we got her attention. Yep. <laughs> uh, we call that a running ovation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. Our only running ovation. That's right. That's right. All right. Next one. For one performance and one performance only, Joe and Carol switched places. Joe did Carol's parts and Carol did Joe's parts. Not no. true. False. <laughs> I, I couldn't fit in her costumes, <laughs> even though I tried real hard. <laughs> look good in the makeup too yeah <laughs> all right we, we just have one more here we go one of them almost went deaf performing the illusion impaled true true okay oh. i'll take this one okay well first tell tell us what impaled looks like i mean i know what it looks like but but oh. for people that are not magicians listening to this you describe it's, the yeah. normal version, and I'll tell them what we do. Yeah, it's called Impaled Beyond Belief. Normally, someone is suspended on something sharp. A sword. It's been done with different things, but yeah, a sword. And then... That's balanced like on a mirror ball or something, so it's like up five feet in the air. The point is facing upwards. Right. And, right, and the person um, the person is balanced on the sword, on the tip of the sword, right? Right, right. in the middle of their back. The so they're back. they're horizontal, parallel to the floor. Right. And then how it's normally done is they are are spun from their feet and they're twirling around. So and they spin like a helicopter blade. Yeah, like a helicopter blade. And then at one point they drop down, the blade comes through their stomach. Okay, got it. So they get impaled. It's called impaled beyond belief is a technical there you go. term. So the version we came up with, uh, we were booked to do the MGM Grand, and they wanted gore. It was the Scream Park. 
So we designed and built this concept, which is that it's a dream sequence. It's a nightmare sequence. It was the opening of the show. And Carol is the power character in this again. I, I'm yanked out of a bed and uh, behind me without me seeing it is uh, this character that's kind of like a Grim Reaper, but with this metal riveted face and this hood and he has this giant spear. So she acts real seductive to me because I'm distracted by her. She pushes my arms behind me and I'm thinking this is going to be a romantic moment. And then he wraps my wrists in these chains that are attached to the spear. I spin around, he sticks the spear under my chin and he forces me up on the pedestal. I don't see what's going on behind me, but Carol picks up an M16 rifle (laughs) and instead of the sword, she balances that on the pedestal. So now I'm lifted up on top of this gun with my hands bound and she indicates for him to spin me around and she sticks her finger in the trigger and stretches her finger 15 feet. She backs oh. away. Big white glove across the stage. And she pulls the trigger and it blows a hole through me and it splatters blood and guts all over this white panel that's hanging above me at a 45 degree angle. Okay. So I end up sliding down the gun barrel. We had a engineer and machinist build this device, which is like a gun that fires sideways that's mounted to my stomach. Mm-hmm. And it shoots 38 caliber blanks. Oh. And they were unbelievably loud. Yeah. Even with earplugs. And so, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, really, really loud. This was an 800 seat auditorium, and everybody in the place ducks when this thing goes <laughs> off. Gosh. So one night we were working on another project where we brought in some guys that were video guys who ran a nightclub next door to the MGM. So they came in to shoot video. And after the first show, he comes up to me and he goes, you know, you could tell your sound guy to turn the volume up with the music. And I'm thinking to myself, nah, that volume is pretty loud, but I'll tell him. And so the next show, I'm laying on the bed, and we have a voiceover intro, and the curtains are opening, and I can see the audience coming into view. And I'm thinking, man, this music is loud. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, my God, I forgot the earplugs. Oh, no. Which is necessary, because this thing is going off, you know, 18 inches from my head. Right. So I go over to start the routine and wake him up. She's going to pull me out of the bed. And he whispers to me, I don't have my earplugs. And I'm like, oh, and, no. and using my worst ventriloquist mouth, I say, okay, what are we going to do? You know, cause I can't let them see me talking to him. And he yeah. goes, we have to do it. And I'm like, you'll go deaf. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So all this time, this whole oh. routine now, I'm just totally in fear of that moment when I'm going to pull the trigger and I'm thinking, here it comes, here it comes, here yeah. it comes. And I pulled the trigger and then, both ears went almost <laughs> deaf. You got that high ringing in your ear kind of thing. And I couldn't hear the music well. I couldn't hear anything for two days. And had to finish the rest of the act. This is in the middle of the show or is it at the, the end? Opener. It's the opening. It's the, oh, opener. it's the opener. That's right. That's our yeah. opener. And so I thought, you know, oh my God, this could do it. This could rupture an eardrum or something. Should I do this? Should I not do it? I don't know. And I went ahead and did it. I have tinnitus now, which I always wonder if that was what caused it. But yeah, it was severe. Wow. Show must go on. Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Dedicated to the Dedicated, art. Yeah. That was fact Ooh. or something John just made up. Ah. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to some fan questions. You guys want some fan questions? Yeah. yeah. All right, your buddy Hal Myers, a.k.a. Damien, who, by the way, is just finishing up a tour of, um, of lectures that is dynamite. I interviewed him, gosh, a long time ago. You can put in uh, Hal Myers in my search engine. You can find his podcast. It's, it's fascinating, too. Cool. Um, he talks about his trip to uh, being one of the first magicians or maybe the first magician ever to go to North Korea. Oh, wow. Uh, to perform. It's yeah. really an interesting story. All right. So he asks, Carol, for you, I understand that you're responsible for the gossamer harness. Oh, yes. This is not an exposure show, so we don't want to expose how anything is done. But it says, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, 
it has a lot to do with balance. And yes, I am a co-creator of it. Oh, the goal of this particular item without giving it away <laughs> is to, so that the person suspended didn't have to wear something large. Oh. So this was designed so that I could wear a strapless dress because I was the, the uh, floater or whatever you want to call it. The suspendee. suspendee. The, suspendee. <laughs> yeah. the floater. Yeah, I put my life on the line. Different balance points on a balcony in New Jersey, just north of Atlantic City. <laughs> mm -hmm. And over time, through a machinist, it was a two-piece. I think I still have the only two-piece harness. It was made so that I could balance just right. I could walk off the stage when the illusion's over, immediately walk back on, ditching the gimmick, so to speak, and yeah. um, do the rest of the show. So, well, it revolutionized it. the effect because, yeah. you know, it looks like there's no possible way that any gimmick could exist when you're doing a broom suspension. And so. Joe and I have used it too. We use it for a flag suspension. It's pretty fun. It, it's beautiful. I, I've used it myself. Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that you uh, you co-created that. That's great. That's great. That's yeah. great information. <laughs> All right, Joe. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hal. Hal also asks Joe, your gumball machine trick won a FISM prize? Question mark. How did you come up with the idea, and were you shocked when you won? That's two questions, I guess. Two part question. Well, yes, I came up with the idea. How did I come up with it? Uh, I talk about this in my lecture because uh, people ask all the time how I come up with these effects because I do a lot of effects that don't use cards and coins and, you know, standard stuff. Smart, by the way, because I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone pull out a deck of cards and everybody around says, oh, I've seen that trick, even though there's a billion card tricks, you know. <laughs> that happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. So back in the 80s, I, I was just keen on creating new effects. And I, you know, went to Walgreens or something. All I did was walk the aisles and make a list of iconic items that people could recognize, like Band-Aids, which, you know, evolved into the Band-Aid trick that a lot of people know that Suzanne did on Penn and Teller Fool Us. Which was Joe's. Band-Aids, Q-tips, oh. all these different things. Uh, and the gumball machine was one of the things that I saw. And I said, oh, there's got to be something cool to do with that. And that jumped into my head immediately, actually. It's, you know, to me, it's a... It's a nest of boxes with a natural item. Yeah. So uh, the gumball machine itself didn't win first place at FISM, you know, because they do have a category for most original effect or best, you know, new creation or something. That was done in the close-up competition, and that was the main effect out of all the stuff I did in that act. And then uh, the second question. Uh, were you shocked when you won? Oh, yeah. I, I was shocked. In fact, people... <laughs> said it was hilarious because we were sitting kind of in the back row of the auditorium and I just, my legs just picked up and started running down the aisle. And <laughs> it's almost a blur to me, but everybody said, oh, it was hilarious, man. You look so thrilled and so surprised. And it, it was true. <laughs> I did a sprint. Joy. Yeah, it was great. Hopefully your body, you know, followed your legs. <laughs> yeah, I could have done a face plant. <laughs> Hal has all sorts of questions for you guys. This is this is his last one. Do you have or what is your favorite routine to do together on stage? Twister. I love Twister. <laughs> it's so much fun <laughs> because he breaks his neck and I'm supposedly the nurse that's going to fix it. So we have all these giant syringes and tongue depressors and all these, a giant watch, all these things, medical things. And it's a fun routine. It's <laughs> You love that routine. I totally love that. Regime. Well, again, it goes back to what we try to do with our stuff, which is justify the magic, even if it's, you know, in a dream or whatever. So when I break my neck on stage, it's a comedy routine, but it's all super choreographed to the music. And there's a reason for this box to exist, which is for her to fix my neck. Ultimately, mm. I think, you know, the audience goes for the ride a little bit more than just watching it be a guy who twists somebody around because they can't. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what we try to do. That's the way we think about all the stuff we do. Almost all of them are really fun to do. I mean, together. you know, we used to do a 90 minute to two hour show and we were touring and almost all of it is original material. It's hard to pick because we just have so much fun working on stage together. Virtually everything we do as a team is just a blast. <laughs> it is. It's fun. <laughs> we almost never do the same show twice. That's no, another fun thing. Not since we've opened the theater. 
All right, Annie Banani, the balloon storyteller out of Southern California says, working together as a married couple, how do you keep your marriage healthy? We so, love each other. That's right. That's one thing. We have separate offices. That's important. Yep. <laughs> and we really do separate responsibilities. Like I'm more of the marketing organized type of personality and he's the creative monster and somehow those two things just mesh yeah it's yeah. great because i hate mundane routine and i'm always trying to create new things and do all kinds of stuff and uh carol is super organized she keeps everything on track she makes sure that i don't get too far off track and <laughs> you know so we have fun i i would say what works is that we still make each other laugh all the time True. we just uh you know saying we love each other sounds like so oh but <laughs> it's it's a fact we're, we're soulmates part of that is just keeping it fresh and and being creative and, and having fun together doing this crazy life thing that we do we're together pretty much 24 7 all the time unless one of us leaves town for some reason so and it seems like the two of you have very different strengths and you play off each other's strengths that's the magic of our uh success yeah it's yeah. great because we coach each other because i have my personality and my ideas and he has his and and we listen to each other we take mm -hmm. each other's um criticism as well as you know accolades accolades right that's the word yeah, Carol is awesome on blocking and stage movement and things, and I'm more of timing, scripted kind of thing. And then as we talked about, we're both so connected musically that when we do a piece with music, it's like no effort. Okay, Douglas Cameron, an amazing magician based in Scotland, asks, does Joe plan on publishing any new material? I miss his clever and creative thinking. Oh, that's nice. Publishing is um, the key word. He's got it. It's just publishing, right? Yeah. I mean, I have tons and tons of stuff that have that's never been released or that I've even put into a form that could be. I guess it's just not a priority for me right now. We're at the point in our lives, though, where we're starting to think that it would be fun to do more headlining things at magic conventions because we've only mm -hmm. done a few in the last 10 years, a handful. And it's always rewarding when you can get good response for your thinking. Joe has an amazing lecture. It no. is so valuable. <laughs> because it's not just about the tricks, but it's, anyway, regardless of that, yes, I would like to put some stuff out. <laughs> Joe's, Joe's, being, Joe's being all, all uh, he's being coy. <laughs> I've been pondering for years to write a book. I am really hesitant to put anything out on DVD or or download because the piracy issue is horrible and I've been burned by that with the gumball machine by so many people for so many years mm. and the band-aid thing you know uh, lots of people want that routine and especially after seeing Suzanne do that on fool us I'm just scared of putting it out there in a wide way because I know it's going to be picked up by somebody in China and they'll be selling it for three bucks within a week yep by the way, you're not the only person who said that. That seems oh. to be running rampant through the, the magic it's industry. Terrible. And it goes back through history of magic. I mean, it goes back to the early 1900s where people are stealing each other's ideas and putting them on the market. I think one way to protect all that stuff is to put out a really nice, expensive, hardbound book, which is my goal eventually in a dream of mine, because it's not easy for people to just rip that off and distribute it. Plus, I think it's more of a permanent legacy. You know, there's so many things that I've developed that have never seen the stage even, or, or they've seen the stage a few times and now they're in storage. And somehow I need that stuff to be out there just so I can establish whatever I've offered to the art. Yeah, the, the book is a great idea too, because it establishes a date. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, even then it's weird. I uh, had a genie issue that was on, I was on the cover of and had contributed a number of things kind of as a one man section for tricks. Yeah. And one of them in there is the linking pretzels, which is something I came up with on an airplane coming back from Fector's way back, like in the mid eighties. Mm -hmm. Years later, I'm walking through a bookstore and I see magic for dummies. Okay. One of the tr tricks that's in there is linking pretzels. Oh, Submit, Unbelievable. submitted by somebody else yeah 
<laughs> so oh, man. even though it was in print during that date, which it was 1991, uh, somebody else decided, oh, I'll just submit this to the guy and I'll take credit for it. So And I'll put my name on it. <laughs> yeah. Dang. Do you have a fun performing story for us, the two of you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was really funny. We were doing a, a show, and this is near the beginning of when we were doing the Dream Masters Illusion show. And we do this version of Cube Zag. So one of the props on stage is a tube. Okay. And we had this tube built with two concentric tubes. So when she shoves the top tube in, she pulls the middle, the, 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 the smaller tube out and sets it back down on the floor. So now they can see through the tube and everything else. And she zigzags the whole thing and everything. And then she reaches over and grabs that top tube, or the, the, the one on the stage, and she lifts it up and swings it towards the audience before she puts it back into the top tube. So they can see what's inside. Yeah. Well, they don't expect it, but my head is inside that tube. Oh, okay. Okay. So she swings this around and you see my head in there and uh, it looks completely real. I mean, it's special effect caliber head. Oh, nice. And so it gets crazy reaction. We've even had some people go, how in the world did you get his head in there? Which is like, come on. <laughs> it's just a gag, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one just... time we're doing this and because everything is so tightly choreographed and Carol is so into the movement of everything and we got to nail every beat in the song. She swings it around and my head falls out of the tube and hits the stage. <laughs> oh no. And, and so, instead of picking it up and doing something with it, my natural instinct is to get rid of it. So I kicked it. <laughs> you kicked it? I she just kicked, kicked my, it like she kicked, Okay, don't look at that. I'll get rid of it really fast. I kicked it off. She stage. kicked it into the wings and she kind of just kept going like maybe they won't notice. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, head rolls on the stage. Maybe nobody saw that. Right. But it's weird in the heat of the moment. It's just like, oh no, get rid of that. <laughs> and then you just continued and, and finished I the did, trick. And... Just like nothing happened. How did his head get from backstage back onto his body? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> that was the best trick of the night. That head disappearing from backstage and reappearing on his shoulders. It was weird. Yeah. And they're all thinking, man, she really doesn't like him. <laughs> she just kicked him in the head. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have some advice for the beginner? Sure, go ahead. Oh gosh, I love coaching. I love teaching. I think it's really important at some point when you're a beginner to read a lot of books and all that, but I think direct some kind of coaching. And if you have a pro, a local pro that can really direct you the right way and maybe undo some bad habits that you might already have, I would just say get some coaching from a pro and certainly don't um, do something before you're ready, not even mm. to a friend or your brother or your sister, you know, because then you get, if you, if you perform and even a close up effect for a family member and it doesn't go well, right from the beginning, you have that negative feeling like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Now, if you're coached enough and you are ready and you get approval from the pro and you do it right, that's a whole other feeling. Yeah. So, you know, that's a positive effect and makes you want to pursue this art. Yeah. I mean, it's a confidence wrecker. If you take a trick the first time out and you try to do it and something goes wrong, it's like, oh God, I'm scared of doing that trick now. I'll never do it again. And even if it's not a pro, you know, a mentor. A mentor. Somebody who knows what they're doing. Work with somebody. Don't learn it off YouTube. Mm. Most of the stuff on YouTube is not being taught properly anyway. If these people were really professional and they knew what they were doing, they probably wouldn't be giving out their tutorials for free. That's right. They'd be performing it. Yeah, we tell our students that from the beginning. So she already said what my advice to the beginner would be, mm. uh, which is don't do a trick for anybody until you've mastered it. Mm. For two reasons, not only because it could break your confidence if you don't do it right or they catch you. For the second reason, magic is such a valuable experience for a spectator that you don't want to do something that, that's mediocre or that they figure out or they catch because you've made some kind of mistake because they lose respect for the magic itself. Yeah. It's not about how the trick works. It's about giving the people this feeling of wonder 
you owe it to the art of magic to practice your tricks enough that you've got it mastered so you can give that gift to the spectator. And if they want coaching from one of the two of you, how would someone go about that? Well, we've never done online coaching, so I know a lot of guys are great at doing that. I mean, that's something we could possibly explore. Contact us through the website, amazingshows.com. There you go. Not a horrible idea. How about some advice for the, uh, for the working pro? Oh, gosh. Practice. <laughs> Practice and take directions. Um, well, that's a good one. Unfortunately, you know, you give out some advice to even a, a fellow working pro, and a lot of times they're insulted instead of taking constructive criticism mm. from a qualified eye that's been doing this for 30, 40 years, you know. So I would just say take direction and don't be insulted. Um, think about it because you can only get better. Mm. No one would give you advice, I don't think, maliciously. They're just doing it to make you better. Okay, so Listen. I didn't know that was going to be Carol's answer, but I love it, which is take direction. Find a director that's not a magician. Uh -huh. Find somebody in you know, high school or college or people that you know that are you know, studying theater and get their opinions on how things look because they're gonna give you a real perspective, not based on method, not based on magic experience. Uh, and you might just be hit with so many new ideas and new angles that something fresh comes out of it. Which brings me to my piece of advice, which is to do something unique to you, especially after running our theater for so many years. You know, there are so many people that do Bill and Lemon, so many mm -hmm. people that do an egg bag, so many people that do a Pavel rope routine. There's so much material out there. There's no reason to duplicate stuff that a lot of other performers already do. If you want to stand out of the crowd, you want to do something in front of an audience they haven't seen before, uh, then they can't anticipate the ending because, you know, we've, we know these rings are going to link yeah. the minute you pull them out. And unless you've got something so unique with your routine and so captivating that it's different to hook the audience, uh, why do it? Come up with stuff, dig through Tarbell. There's so much stuff in there that nobody touches that is brilliant, you know, and we've got a wealth of material at, at our disposal. So why duplicate what other magicians are doing? If you want to be memorable, do something different. You don't have to originate the effect, but find something that identifies you that nobody else is doing. All right, give us a recommended book and I'll let you guys out of here. Oh, I've always been a uh, positive thinking person book. There's lots mm -hmm. of them out there. Um, first one I read when I was on cruise ships trying to stay out there for five years. I set my goal on being a cruise director. Think and Grow Rich was one of them. The Power of Positive Thinking is another one. There's a slew of them. There's The Secret. I, I can go on and on. But it, it just helps you with goal setting and helps you kind of keep on the right track, not just in your profession, but in your daily life. Yeah. Carol, did you just read my bookshelf? Just no, now? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I, I guess it's the same. <laughs> I believe in all those positive things too. It's, it's, yeah. it's how I like to live my life. Yeah. Well, same here. and some of those books, you know, especially like Think and Grow Rich, it talks a lot about uh, how you work with other people and so forth. And, uh, you know, that's another piece of advice, especially for the pros, I think, which is be a nice person, be easy to get along with backstage. Yeah. About the relationships you build if you want to build your career. You ready for my books? Yes, yes. Give me your books, Joe. Well, in the magic realm, this is one I always comes first to mind. The Trick Brain by Daryl Fitzke. Hmm. That was hugely influential in my entire view of magic when I was like 12 years old. And that's part of the Fitzke trilogy. There's showmanship for magicians, you know, um, or whatever he called it. I don't know. I'm He's looking, looking on his shelf. <laughs> magic and showmanship, which I think was Henning Gnomes. Either way, Trick Brain is about creating magic. Yeah. And he breaks it down into, I think, 17 categories or 17 possible effects. So you've got appearances, vanishes, penetrations, transpositions, and it goes on and on uh, and breaks it down into the different categories of even mentalism. Mm. And then he comes up with this formula on how to invent new tricks by 
having these various lists and teaches you how to make your own and so forth that generates creativity and it generates thought and it also helps you understand all the principles that can be used. He breaks everything down into, if you're gonna make a vanish happen, here are all the possible principles you can use to make something disappear. Hmm. So it's kind of a formula for creating new effects. And so that was hugely inspirational to me. And then another one that's not magic oriented, but another book that I think is spectacular is called A Curious Mind. Hmm. Not the movie. Brian Glazer? Brian Grazer. Oh. He's the movie producer that has worked on so many hit films with Ron Howard. Yep. And I haven't read the book, but we got the audio book and listened to it. And it's all about curiosity and how if you keep your mind curious all the time, your life is going to be always enhanced. Uh, He uses examples in the movies that they've done on how curiosity is used for getting the story and hooking the audience and keeping them interested. To me, that's invaluable because magic by its nature is makes people curious. They want to know typically where this trick is going to end because we don't usually give them the result until the surprise moment. So that's built into most magic. But just by understanding how to use this when you construct your routines and when you write your scripts and things, it's an incredible book for that. Those are my two. I like all of those. All right. (laughs) Well, thanks, guys, for doing my show. That was fun. It was fun. Thanks, John. This has been terrific, John. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for asking us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for being on. Uh, Do you have any social media or anything else you'd like to promote? Theater Dreams in Castle Rock. That's our Facebook page. We also have Dream Masters page, which is our show. And just don't forget the website, amazingshows.com. If you're ever in the area, you can see who's coming up. We've scheduled shows up to six months in advance. Check it out. So when you're in Colorado, you got to visit the theater. That's right. Thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend to listen. You can reach me from my Facebook page. Just shoot me out a message. And while you're there, join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist, where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests like Joe and Carol. Thanks again, Joe and Carol, for your time. Thank you, John. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. All right. Woohoo! That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist, but until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.